so good morning everyone uh very nice uh, i hope you have enjoyed your last weekend uh today again we are starting with the chronic uh, uh, diseases in which we will discuss today uh, after discussing uh, hmm, heart kidney and uh, hmm, other organs now today we will discuss the liver what should we do with the chronic liver conditions uh and uh, again today we have a uh, arun arun and anuja i think uh, after uh, i i visualize that after 30 years if uh, or 50 years when they will be old and people will discuss the history of palliative medicine in india so they will always give their photograph both of, both the photographs that oh they did the first palliative md palliative medicine in the country so they have made a history and arun is here to be well prepared to explain how we should handle a patient with chronic liver disease arun after finishing his md he did a very important course which everyone tries must do uh, masters in translational translational research in cancer uh, in 2017 uh and currently he is working again in a premier institute of country that is Ta- uh, tata memorial hospital uh, mumbai so arun over to you and we will be, we are waiting to hear and everyone all the residents are there ask they are curiously waiting how to handle a patient who is suffering with chronic liver disease thank you arun arun start yes uh, thank you uh, sushma madam and uh, thank you ipc for the opportunity good morning everyone uh, let us start today so we'll discuss about uh, palliative care for patients with end stage liver disease and uh, the introductory slide itself has got the content where you can see the diagram of the liver the gall bladder the pancreas and the bile passage so uh, before starting any organ or system of the body i think we uh, for the students actually it's important to read about the basic physiology the anatomy so this is a simple slide where you can see how the liver is situated with respect to the bile duct the pancreas and the duodenum this is important and we'll come to that during the presentation so for today's uh, topic uh, i will cover these things it is of course a big topic a liver disease so uh, it's not possible to cover everything in a lot of depth but i'll try to touch down on important uh, things and the details i'll show you i'll give you the sources and you can go and read from those references so we'll basically cover about end stage liver disease also called as esld and cirrhosis we'll talk about the epidemiology and the need for palliative care in this condition we'll talk about how the disease behaves the disease trajectory and the models which have been developed to predict the behavior of the disease in a patient we'll talk about complications and palliative care management of those complications also a little bit i'll touch down on liver transplant because that is quite important and how we can do concurrent care model in liver transplant and including palliative care and the last bit is recent updates and future research recent updates is important because for the students who are doing md is a paper in itself paper number 4 is all about recent updates so let's uh, see what we have for today so i'll start with um cirrhosis so as you can see this uh, figure explains a lot so cirrhosis is a late stage of chronic progressive liver disease liver architecture is distorted and there is formation of regenerative nodules important here is to understand that cirrhosis can be compensated cirrhosis and it can also be decompensated cirrhosis so compensated cirrhosis typically the patient will be uh, with you under your care for a typical period of 6 to 12 years so that's quite a long time and you have time to work with the patient but a time in will come when the liver functions get deranged and we can call them as complications of liver injury we can call them as end stage liver disease we can also call them as decompensated cirrhosis 
and typically when such kind of decompensation uh, happens, then we got around two years with us. So uh, it's important to understand what decompensations, what kind of complications we are talking about. So as you know, there can be variceal hemorrhage, there can be accumulation of fluid ascites, there can be spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Sometimes uh, one complication is uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, which can happen in long-standing infectious disease of the year. We'll talk about it later. And not only the liver, when the liver is involved, you know the kidneys suffer as well. And that condition is known as hepatorenal syndrome. It's important to understand that once the HRS, the hepatorenal syndrome sets in, the prognosis is pretty bad, can be in terms of weeks and maybe months. And then there is something known as hepatopulmonary syndrome, complications with lungs. And uh, for the students, how will you understand what are the what, are, what in this diagram you can see all these things over here about cirrhosis? There is spare's body here. There is muscle wasting. There is spider angioma. These are clinical uh, features that you can see uh, in a patient with cirrhosis, and there are many, including jaundice. So uh, cirrhosis and end stage liver disease. So end stage liver disease can come after cirrhosis. So let us talk about this com condition the end stage liver disease, liver failure, also called as decompensated cirrhosis. So generally uh, liver failure uh, in our situation is irreversible. And one of the things that can be done in liver failure is and increasingly done these days is liver transplantation. It can be definitive, uh, potentially curative for selected patients. Uh, we don't have a lot of scope to get into liver transplantation for today's topic. So I'll just touch liver transplantation then and there. And I'll tell you how palliative care can be integrated into even for a patient who has undergone liver transplantation. But unfortunately, you must understand that many candidates are not there for transplantation because of some psychosocial reasons, clinical reasons, and a long waiting list. So it is important to understand the role of palliative care in liver disease because transplantation is not for everyone. So there's a paper that you can read in this uh, regard is palliative care and end stage liver disease, a critical review of current knowledge. And in that paper, the authors have discussed very nicely about the various aspects about palliative care and how liver transplantation palliative care can go together. So let us now try to understand what is the need for pa palliative care and what, what is the incidence of these kind of chronic liver conditions in the world. So recently, this uh, publication came out, the Global Atlas of Palliative Care. Uh, this is 2020 publications. And you can see on the top right hand of the page, there is disease of the liver. A small 2.4%, but nevertheless, when we talk about a global uh, scenario, that's quite a huge burden. And so definitely there is a need for palliative care in liver disease. That is the point I want to make. Interestingly, you uh, must try to appreciate over here that not only in primary disease of the liver, but also in hepatocellular malignancy, which comes under malignancy, which is around 228.2%, all kind of cancers, a part of it is hepatocellular cancer. So also in hepatocellular cancer, there can be a need for palliative care. So it's both benign condition and a malignant condition where your skills for palliative care in liver diseases might come into handy. So that is important to understand. So this is about the global scenario. In the next slide, I'll talk to you about what is there in India. So I kind of searched through the literature and I could find this one in the year 2017. In October by Dr. Mukherjee et al. It came out like etiology and mode of presentation of chronic liver disease. It's a big study, a multi-centric trial in India. They did over 11 hospitals with a lot of patients, 2666 to one patients. And they found out that chronic liver disease is present in around 19% of the population. And among those 19%, also 1301 for around 13,000 patients, around 34% presents with decompensated cirrhosis. That's quite a huge amount, like one third. So the need is definitely there in India as well as world literature is concerned. It's up, it's up to us, up to us, the palliative care doctors and also other specialists to bring in palliative care into 
uh, regular care of the patients. The way to bring in, we'll again discuss in the next few slides. Let us now shift, try to understand how the disease behaves, how chronic liver failure behaves, or the trajectory of the disease. So to understand that, we have to um, think about what is the etiology of the liver disease? What is the severity of the liver disease? Are there any complications and are there any comorbid conditions along with liver disease? Because I have uh, told you before the liver disease is not in isolation. It also affects the lung, it affects the kidneys as well. So a few things that uh, researchers, uh, medical researchers have tried to understand and worked on. One of them is the child poor classification. We know that. And when the uh, thing about transplantation came into practice, then people developed another scoring system, another model of care, also known as the model for end stage liver disease. We'll talk about that in the next few slides. Not only child POOG or MELD score, when you try to understand the condition of a patient, we have to be careful about a few other things, like is the patient having HRF, hepatorenal syndrome? Are there variceal bleeding? Is there any hepatopulmonary syndrome? Is there any hypertension which needs pressure support? Is there low sodium? Low sodium is again an important factor which has come into MALD score later. Is there any jaundice? And what is the performance status of the patient? All these things are important when you want to prognosticate, when you want to talk about a person who is suffering from liver disease. So I have two slides, one on child POOG classification of severity of cirrhosis. So as you can see, the child POOG system uh, on the left-hand side, you can see is based on certain parameters. I mean, the students can go through it when they get time and it is important to um, understand the child POOG system. Basically, it gives you a score. So if the score is, you see, five to six, uh, it's also known as CPA, child book A, is well compensated. And as the score increases, the decompensation of the liver disease increases. Why is it understand? Why, why is it important to understand the CP score? Because you see, uh, uh, the score gives you an idea about the survival or the prognosis of the patient. When you talk to a patient, when you talk to a family uh, or the caregiver of the patient, they might ask you, uh, how do you, uh, what do you think the patient is in? What condition is the patient in, in? So whatever you speak to them, you should have some kind of understanding about the condition of the patient and this will help you definitely. So with class A <clears throat> and class B and class C, you can see how the patient fares in the next few years. And this has been taken from the original publication which came in 1987 by Infante Rifard et al. in hepatology. So this is child POOG scoring system is there from quite some time. Next came the MALD. So one slide for MALD as well. So you see the MALD stands for model for end stage liver disease and it is used increasingly in centers where they do liver transplantation. On the left hand side, you can see it's a multifactorial score and how this score fares along with the survival, you can see that. So basically, uh, it uses patient's lab values and also it uses sodium, which has come in later. And the original publication is from Weissner et al. in 2003 in the journal Gastroenterology. So uh, interesting to understand over here is that the male score has got important exceptions like cancer, hepatocellular cancer, hepatopulmonary syndrome, Auto pulmonary hypertension and uh, and few others. You can read it up in details if you want. The male scoring system has important prognostic value in certain other settings, and it actually increases its applicability in these conditions. For example, selecting a patient for TIPS placement in alcohol-associated hepatitis, again in hepatorenal syndrome, in ha in hemorrhage in assessment of surgical mortality risk in liver disease. So the male score is being increasingly used in centers. It's a multifactorial score, and it is good to know, to understand the male scoring and CPS, even you are a palliative care physician. It is also important when you uh, speak in a multidisciplinary team, you speak the same language as the hepatologist and gastroenterologist. That kind of get you in the board. So uh, a little bit of shift now. So what are the criteria 
Uh, this is from American literature from Center for Medicare and Medicare Services. You can see that when are patients considered in the terminal stage of liver disease and for palliative care referrals. So life expectancy of less than six months, and if they follow certain criteria, uh, they are biochemical like prothrombin time is prolonged, albumin basically uh, functions of liver, then end stage liver disease with the following, at least one of the following like ascites, refractory to treatment, uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, hepatorenal syndrome, urine sodium concentration, hepatic encephalopathy, recurrent varicell bleeding, despite your best intensive therapy. Also documentation of the following factors support eligibility for hospice care. Progressive malnutrition, muscle wasting, continued active alcoholism, because you know alcohol consumption, alcohol abuse is an important factor which leads to cirrhosis in the long term in our country. Hepatocellular carcinoma, hepatitis B, C infections and refractory to treatment. So this is not for our country, as you can see, this is for the US, but it is important for the students, I think, to read about uh, the literature, relevant literature from other countries as well. So this is one of them. So we are talking about liver disease, we're talking about palliative care, but I'm sure if I ask you, do you see palliative care getting into liver disease management? Do you see palliative care doctors working with hepatologists in most of the centers? We don't see. So definitely there is a gap and our barrier in palliative care provision. So in this cartoon, you can see the gap. In one side is say the palliative care doctor and the other side is the standard care for liver. And you see there is a big gap in between. So uh, I'm drinking water in between. So please pardon me. So uh, if we talk about this gap, some research has been done about why is there a gap and has there been any research which has looked into this gap. So one of the uh, uh, seminal publications that came out about this kind of gap and why this kind of gap exists is this uh, paper in quite recently in 2019 from Journal of Palliative Medicine by uh, James Philip Esteban. And they uh, saw the attitudes of liver and palliative care clinicians to a specialist palliative care consultation in this condition of ESLD. And so they spoke to uh, palliative care clinicians as well as hepatologists. And so what is the reason? Why don't people refer? Is there a problem in approaching the patient? Is there a misunderstanding about what palliative care does for the patient? What is the reason? And you can go through the paper. It will give you a good idea about why such kind of gap exists and what can be done to kind of remove that gap. But interestingly, there has been uh, research done as well elsewhere where uh, one important trial is known as the support trial. Uh, some, someone is uh, unmuted. Can you please mute yourself? Mercy, I think. So, thanks. So uh, in the support trial, the support stands for study to understand prognosis and preferences for outcomes and risks of treatment. It came out in the year 2000 in the uh, General American Geriatric Society where Roth, Kellin, they have shown that patients with end stage liver disease have rates of moderate to severe pain towards the end of life. And that is similar to those patients with lung or colorectal cancer. Now, at least in our country and as well, as well as elsewhere, we know that cancer and palliative care is kind of important in cancer to place it like that. But not only in, in cancer, you see in liver disease as well, there's a big need uh, for pain control and for other things as well. So palliative care is important in liver disease as well. And this is one of the seminal trials, the support trial, which has shown in the year 2000, like 20 years back, that palliative care is important in liver disease. But unfortunately, not much has been done on that front. And definitely, when I say not much has been done, it's basically inadequate palliative care. And this is another publication, important one, by Punja uh, in the... Journal of Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology in the year 2014, where they've shown that patients with cirrhosis and denied liver transplant patient. I spoke to you about not all patients getting liver transplant. So, and quite a few of them are denied liver transplant. And unfortunately, even if they are not candidates for liver transplant, they don't get uh, adequate palliative care or appropriate uh, management. 
Oh, I can see the chat coming in. We'll talk about the chat in the later part. So, uh, but uh, uh, interestingly, you can see there has been research as well where they have tried to understand how palliative care can fit in into this um, treatment or into this program of liver transplant. This is a paper in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management in 2015 by Bauman AG, where they have shown what is the benefit of early palliative care intervention in end-stage liver disease when the patient is actually waiting for liver transplant. So I told you that I'll touch into transplant, not like details of transplant, but here and there in the throughout the presentation. And we'll see that transplantation, palliative care, they can actually go hand in hand because every patient, even if they go for transplant, have got needs for symptom control and other psychosocial issues. So a, a person who is in, interested in reading into uh, greater depths can definitely go into this literature and you'll see how that works out. So again, this is a referral criteria for end-stage liver disease, as we spoke before. But this is uh, from the BMJ by Boyd, recognizing and managing key transitions in end-of-life care. This is one of the important publications as far as uh, ESLD literature is concerned. That's why I put in over here. So let's see what they say. Basically, almost similar things. Biochemical profile, serum albumin, prothrombin time, uh, presence of cancer, advanced cirrhosis with one or more uh, complications like ascites, NK, HRF, peritonitis, and variceal bleeds. All these things can uh, uh, be considered when you refer a patient for palliative care. I'll talk to you about these complications now. So let us go into it. What are the needs? So we talked about physical symptoms and we'll talk in detail in the next few slides. Um, psychological symptoms like confusion, depression, anxiety, confusion, depression, confusion basically can come with hepatic and cephalopathy. It's important to understand how advanced care planning is done in end-stage liver disease. Why? We'll talk again later. End-of-life care, pre and post transplant, even if the patient is taken for transplant, palliative care can come in. So uh, one important publication that came in 2020, pretty recent in Journal of Pain and Symptom Management is about healthcare utilization and end of life care outcomes for patients with decompensated cirrhosis based on transplant candidacy. So basically, again, I'm, I'm making the point over here that transplant doesn't mean the patient doesn't need palliative care. Transplant palliative care can go hand in hand. Palliative care doesn't mean it is the end of everything. There is also an important message we need to bring in over here. Now we'll go into the complications of uh, hepatic failure and how to manage those complications in the next few slides. So ascites, it's important for our students to understand about ascites. So uh, basically for ascites, we can start with uh, diuretic therapy, but you have to check the serum ascites albumin gradient, that is SAAG. Also check uh, sodium restriction has to be done in diet, no more than two, two grams per day of sodium. Medications that decrease the blood pressure and also basically the renal perfusion should be avoided in a person with ascites. So you, I'm talking about beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and NSAIDs. Important to understand that NSAIDs can, can, should be avoided in liver failure. We'll talk about it again later. What can you do? You can do serial large volume paracentesis and it can adequately control liver symptoms. You can also go for shunts, not in cancer, but in non-cancer conditions, shunts and peritoneal drains. Uh, important to understand about peritoneal drains. A lot of study has been done about peritoneal drains and they can be important for palliative care patient because peritoneal drains can be can stay uh, with the patient for quite some time and the patient can undergo paracentesis even at home. No need to run to the hospital every time for paracentesis, saves a lot of time, saves a lot of cost, saves a lot of caregiver problem if you can do peritoneal synthesis at home. So important to understand the role of peritoneal drains in ascites. One uh, important clinical thing that people ask us in the clinic always, and there's a big kind of confusion about how much acidic fluid shall be drained. So I got into guidelines and this is the AS ASLD practice guidelines from 2009. And what they say is that you can do serial therapeutic paracentesis. It's a treatment approach for refractory ascites, yes. And post paracentesis albumin infusion may not be uh, mark my word, may not be necessary for a single paracentesis of less than four to five liters. There's a lot of myths. Someone, someone is unmuted. Can you please mute yourself? Thank you. 
there's a dr vasanta can you please mute yourself thanks there's a lot of confusion about how much paracentesis should we do shall we do paracentesis shall we give albumin infusion shall we give colloid people ask us these things every day in the opd in the casualty where they do paracentesis and i must i want to tell you look at the guidelines this is the guidelines if you tap less than 4 to 5 liter you did not give albumin infusion people are afraid about hypertension people are afraid about renal perfusion so this is what the guidelines say now it's up to you to take it up the next is diuretic resistant ascites so diuretics i talked about diuretics it might not work after some time so when we say it's a diuretic resistant ascites this is a question so uh, that can come in the exam so at least one of the following criteria is present in the absence of therapy with nsaid so basically inability to mobilize ascites despite confirmed adherence to adequate dietary sodium restriction and diuretic therapy maximum of 400 per day of uh, spironolactone 160 mg of furosemide so this is the maximum dose you are giving to the patient still is not working there is a reaccumulation of fluid after you do paracentesis the development of diuretic resistant uh, complications can happen like azotemia and kf progressive electrolyte imbalance so then we call it a uh, diuretic resistant ascites in patient with cirrhosis okay uh, uh, the next slide is a slide where you can get an idea about uh, bilirubin metabolism because bilirubin metabolism is important to understand about pathophysiology of jaundice so as you can see uh, there are three things prehepatic hepatic and post hepatic i will not go into details in the slide and you can read it up later uh, when you get time and it is very much self explanatory and you can also see the various conditions is written on the slide uh, when the obstruction or the damage happens either in the pre uh, hepatic or post hepatic phase this has been taken from surgery journal it's an oxford international edition so what i want to talk to you about next is to understand about jaundice in two basic different ways so one is conjugated one is unconjugated if you want to know about jaundice is important to understand the reference level of bilirubin in serum which is uh, you can see total bilirubin up to 1 and direct bilirubin up to 0.4 more than that we call it biochemically as jaundice so conjugated is basically uh, because of cannulicular organic ion transport what is that you can refer to the previous site is written over there what is cannulicular organic ion transport and sinusoidal reuptake of conjugated bilirubin can be defective extra hepatic polystasis can there which is commonly seen in cancer biliary obstruction and intra hepatic polystasis there is a asterisk over there i'll talk to you about why is there an asterisk unconjugated is basically production is increased uptake is impaired and conjugation is impaired so the asterisk means that in case of end stage liver disease of any kind of condition we can see intrahepatic polystasis as well as impaired conjugation so the picture i want to bring in here is that it can be a mixed kind of jaundice you might not get conjugated or unconjugated but you can get a mixed variety it is important to note when you uh, see the charts of a patient so quite often uh, patients come with extra hepatic cholestasis say in pancreatic cancer you know remember the slide i showed you in the first uh, time the anatomy so if there is pancreatic cancer is there a uh, bile duct cancer is there a duodenum mass which is obstructing the drainage then there can be bile duct obstruction extra hepatic cholestasis and one important thing that is that is coming up is biliary drainage and i looked into literature and dr watnagar has published in the year 2016 current status of percutaneous transhepatic biliary drainage also known as ptbd in palliation of malignant obstruction of obstructive jaundice it's a very good procedure there is some some uh, check up that has to be done before you do ptbd like uh, pt inr etc etc you can read through the paper it's very nicely explained over there so other than surgical bypass uh, ptbd is a minimally invasive procedure and another thing that can be done is also ercp but sometimes ercp is not possible ptbd is uh, quite a useful procedure and handy in those situations can be done on a day care basis so it is important to understand when to refer a patient for ptbd or surgical bypass or ercp uh, for palliative care doctors because patients typically come to us in a cancer setup with obstructive jaundice please go through the paper another complication we talked about is nkf hepatic encephalopathy so it is important to understand uh, hepatic encephalopathy from clinical point of view but also when you do 
preferences like decision preferences what to be what is to be done uh, in advanced uh, condition basically advanced care planning because a person with hepatic nk uh, is at risk of having end of life care decision being made by the others so it is important to understand if the patient is in nk if the patient isn't in nk and if the patient can decide for himself or herself so basically to prevent nk we can avoid dehydration and electrolyte abnormality we have to provide nutrition support to the patient and a safe environment because there is always a risk of fall in a person suffering from nk person can get delirious again another uh, area of debate nutrition people said do not give protein to the person who is having nk because that will increase um, azotemia again i looked into literature so what the literature says is that patient should be instructed to eat small meals throughout the day with a late night snack of complex carbohydrates we have to lower the ammonia production yes and absorption of medications such as lactulose lactitol rifaximin a gut, gut acting antibiotic can be used to lower the ammonia i have never seen anywhere where they say do not give a protein to the patient rather they say you give uh, food but small meals throughout the day late night snack of complex carbohydrates so another area of uh, considerable debate now uh, palliative care uh, a seminar of palliative care is never complete without discussion about pain so why do you see what can we see uh, about pain in palliative care and liver disease definitely there is abdominal distension as it is we talked about there can be infection peritonitis but important to understand when we talk about pain and management of pain in liver failure we have to also understand about assessment of pain so is there an encephalopathy look out for encephalopathy pain reporting in encephalopathy also look out for non pharmacological measures why non pharmac measures because in liver failure there can be associated hrs kidney problems there can be associated lung problems there is definitely altered drug metabolism in the liver so you don't know how the medicines will behave once it gets inside the body and is there any substance use uh, from before take a history of that uh, alcohol abuse you know can lead to liver failure in the long run so after you have looked into all these things what are the drugs which are safe to be given in liver failure so a lot of again uh, controversy about paracetamol so basically what the guideline says is that paracetamol can be given if there is no alcohol consumption but do not exceed 2 grams in a day what is the opioid uh, we can use for liver failure the safest is fentanyl fentanyl why because also can be used if there is hrf that is hepatic renal failure and uh, can be used in setting of cirrhosis there is no dose adjustment needed for a single bolus dose patient comes in a lot of pain and you can give it but if you want to use it repeatedly in a chronic uh, setup you have to reduce the dose and frequency by approximately 25 to 50% uh, so one of the uh, usual things that you can do is initiate the transdermal patch at usually half the dose what adjuvant can you use for neuropathic pain you can use pregabalin uh, because it has got some metabolism uh, it doesn't have much of metabolism in the liver initiate treatment 50 mg orally uh, twice in a day and gradually titrate it up if needed over weeks due to delayed onset of action now we we can argue that in all centers we don't get free gabalin we don't get fentanyl what to be done in for those centers so that's why you got the next slide for us now uh, basically we have to remember that use the drug with the lowest effective dose so you have to clinically monitor the patient if they are getting the benefit can you use methadone yeah but be careful because methadone has reduced clearance in liver failure it has extended half life so very careful when using methadone can you use buprenorphine very commonly used even in our opds these days because it has sublingual preparation again buprenorphine has reduced clearance so you have to use it carefully maybe uh, prolong the duration of action and give less dose morphine has interesting increased bioavailability in liver failure because the liver is not working properly so you decrease the dose of morphine extended half life give less a morphine at increased dosing intervals tricyclic antidepressants commonly used for neuropathic pain has increased bioav use lesser dose ssris reduce clearance extended half life use lesser dose can you use tramadol tramadol is a pro drug it needs the liver to get into active metabolite so please do not use tramadol in liver failure it is not going to act can you use nsaid in liver failure please do not use nsaid in liver failure use paracetamol okay NSAIDs will cause renal injury. It can give rise to hepatorenal failure. 
NSAIDs will derange the bleeding parameters. So all these things can be read up. There's a chapter in palliative care formulary uh, seven. You can also read five or six, PCA five, six, they're equally good. And there's a comprehensive chapter where they talk about drugs to be used in liver failure. Okay, let's uh, move on. So varicell hemorrhage. So varicell hemorrhage is important complication of liver failure and achieve hemostasis when there is a hemorrhage. So you know what is to be done when there is an acute condition, resuscitation, medical endoscopic therapy. When a person comes to casualty, we have not spoken to the patient. We have not seen the patient before and the relatives want everything to be done for the patient. It's a case of hemostasis. So we do that. But sometimes there is end of life care. So in end of life care, of course, we are not going that invasive. The family is prepared. The patient is prepared for end of life care in that case. It is important to educate regarding the future risk of bleeding to the patient and family members. And the emergency plan includes, as you know, for usual, dark linens, protective equipment for family caregivers, availability of subcutaneous or rectal opioids and benzodiazepines if there is a catastrophic bleed and nothing can be done for the patient. So two different settings and two different kinds of management. So you can read up more about it in the publication by Kremers in the year 2016 in Therapeutic Advanced Gastroenterology, where they discuss in details about how to manage varicell and non varicell upper GI bleed in cirrhosis. One important point, uh, pruritus, a very uh, important and very kind of itchy thing. So what to be done in pruritus in jaundice? Uh, people use a lot of things, but what is uh, the evidence base. So basically the evidence talks about using topical emollients, uh, you avoid hot baths and rubbing of the skin. That is just don't keep on scratching. In other words, uh, cool humidified air can be used to reduce pruritus, minimize the use of harsh soaps, fragrances and detergents, loose fitting clothing and bedsheet can be used. So these are non-pharmac. In palliative care, I want to bring up this point that when you talk about pharmac, we should always think about non-pharmacological management because that is equally important for our patients. If you want to give some medicines to the patient, uh, we can start with a bile acid sequestrant if it is a pruritus due to obstructive jaundice. So uh, the medicines that we have with us in our country are cholestyramine and cholestipol. You can also use rifampin to increase the uh, metabolism of products. SSRIs can be used, for example, sertraline. It's like in an adjuvant medication as far as pruritus is concerned. Sometimes, interestingly, you see people have tried using naltrexone. It's an opioid antagonist for pruritus, but when you use naltrexone, needless to say that you have to think about analgesia because there can be increased pain when you give naltrexone, particularly if the patient is on opioids for pain control. So more about this, uh, you can read up in this publication by Dahl in Management of Pruritus in Cholestatic Liver Disease in Current Hepatology. It's a 2020 publication, quite updated. I went through the publication and they have spoken in details and how these things work in control of pruritus. You can please go through it and read in depth. Another important complication as far as symptoms. Yeah, someone is asking in the chat about dose of cholesterol frequency. That's what I'm telling, please go through the publication. It is given in depth and details what is to be done, what is the dose, how it works, et cetera, et cetera. So muscle cramps, we don't talk about muscle cramps a lot. We don't mind not even ask the patient about muscle cramps, but it is a very annoying symptom for the patient. So uh, in case of muscle cramps, please rule out electrolyte abnormality, please rule out kidney disease, kidney injury, because I have spoken to you before that liver function gets deranged and the kidneys can be affected as well. What can be done? We can start with branch chain, chain amino acids for four gram granules three times a day. We can give taurine. Uh, zinc repletion can be done. If patient has zinc deficiency, vitamin E can be given. Again, uh, we are, no one is certain if all these things will uh, take care of muscle cramps, but these are the things that can be tried. Not very high quality evidence, not very high quality randomized control trials in muscle cramps, but has been seen that these things kind of work. Uh, you can go again in details in Shivang Mehta publication in uh, clinical gastroenterology and hepatology from the year 2013. They have discussed these in details. Okay, so we talked about the symptoms. Uh, I must, uh, I want to talk to you about qualitative studies. 
uh, in when you read palliative care, uh, we have to be mindful about how the patients and the caregivers feel about a particular symptom, particular disease, about care plan. So qualitative studies say a lot. So one of the uh, qualitative studies that was done in this area of end-stage liver disease is by Guy in the year 2006. It came out in Journal of Critical Care. Uh, the paper is Liver Failure, Life Support, Family Support, and Palliation, an inside story. So uh, this paper talks about the experience of Victoria Guy as she witnessed her sister's death from alcohol-related liver disease. Let us take a moment to go through the experience of Victoria Guy. So what uh, she says is that at last, I realized with absolute certainty and for the first time that we were no longer helping my sister. I refused to watch her whimper and cry in pain any longer. I decided to be her advocate. It's important. You have to be someone's advocate because the person can have and give. I requested palliative care and morphine was ordered. What dose of morphine, how to be given, we discussed. <laughs> With confidence, I told my sister we were trying to get her home as she always wished. This never happened. That is, the person could not go home. She died in the hospital four days later at the age of 46. So you see the pain, the agony that the person is suffering from. And probably uh, Victoria Guy has brought out this thing in a very lucid way. And this is just not one story. I think this is a story you can relate to many patients if you talk to them, if you go to their pain, go through their agony. And an important part of palliative care is that we have to put ourselves in the patient's shoes. And this is an important area, instead of liver disease. And palliative care probably can help patients to come out of this kind of agonizing situations and have a good quality of death. To talk about death, uh, I'm not concluding my uh, seminar over here. There is much more. So let us move on. So again, when we talk about palliative care, liver disease, what are the barriers? So we, I call it barriers revisited, barriers version two. So, you know, we talked about prognosis, those scoring systems, certain clinical signs, there is prognostic uncertainty. There is definitely delayed referral. You might be called in casualty and asked to see a patient who is suffering from end stage liver failure and not much can be done at that point of time, delayed referral. Goals of care has to be discussed quite early because you don't want the patient to go into NCAFE and then start with the goals of care discussion. Provider practice patterns. We discussed about a paper where they discussed in details about provider practice patterns. Provider means uh, both palliative care doctors and the hepatologist. Access to palliative care. It's an important point. Given the number of palliative care doctors in our country or doctors who, special, who practice palliative care, don't uh, just not talk about specialization. There, there aren't many. There aren't many doctors to go and get themselves integrated into hepatic uh, in hepatology or gastroenterology. What are the models of delivery? I, I will come into this. There are two models of delivery that has been spoken in palliative care literature and end stage liver disease, and the lack of evidence base in end stage liver disease. Yes, uh, some studies have been done in palliative care for ESLD, but there is a scope to do a lot more studies. I'll come to that as well. So the key literature that uh, you might want to read if we talk about ESLD and liver failure is uh, from Hansen in the year 2012. So in this paper, Hansen brings about a very uh, important point about pre-transplant and how palliative care can get integrated for pre-transplant patient, how you can provide comfort to a patient who is going for transplant. What are the uh, agonies uh, related in pre-transplant? There are a lot of Confusion in pre-transplant, if the transplant is going to work, if it doesn't work, what happens then? It's a lot of things. You can read about it. Punja, we discuss about this, is about transplant denial for patients who were on the waiting list. They become sick. They come out of the transplant program. Then what happens? What is going to happen to the patient? Important paper is also Beck. There's barriers to consult for palliative care. Then Kathpalia 2016, they discuss about uh, delayed or absent consult in hepatic failure and Woodland H. et al. 2020 is a very comprehensive paper by uh, Dr. Woodland uh, is from Bristol, I think, and they talk about palliative care in instant liver disease. It's like a whole chapter. If you read the paper, you will. It's like reading a chapter in a book. It's a good paper. So uh, I told you that we'll talk about the models of care of palliative care, uh, how you can integrate yourself into 
hepatology. So one uh, model that, that is spoken into uh, in literature is concurrent care model. And this is discussed in detail in this publication by Anne Railing in the year 2013, uh, which came out uh, in uh, pancreas, biliary tract and liver editorial. So they talk about the concurrent care model like palliative care and hepatology care, liver care goes on side to side. Original hospice philosophy uh, has been brought about in that paper. I mean, original hospice philosophy was that palliative care and uh, care for the disease should uh, go side to side. But somehow, I don't know how things have evolved. It has happened that hospice care is end of life care. So they revisited the original hospice philosophy where hospice care goes along with palliative care and disease management. A lot of work has to be done in this area of concurrent care model as far as policy, hospital referred policy is concerned, as far as research is con concerned. Research in this sense means research into care model for disease. Uh, you take the cue from cancer palliative care, particularly early palliative care for lung cancer, which has uh, come into uh, a practice and a lot of patients increasingly are being referred for lung cancer early in their disease to palliative care. Why? because it has been shown that palliative care works. So I would request the students, the faculty, uh, and others who are listening to this lecture to maybe do some research in early integration of palliative care in liver disease as well, not only liver cancer, but any kind of liver disease and see if it benefits the patient. So that's an open call for research, uh, happy to collaborate. Uh, another model uh, along with concurrent care model has come is integrated uh, model for patient-centered advanced liver disease care. So concurrent care is a bit different from integrated care. And you can read up the paper in details. This is a paper by Anand Naik. It came out quite recent in 2020 uh, in Clinical Gastroenterological Hepatological Journal where they talked about how integrated model in a hospital, like you do rounds together, you see the patient in the clinic together is integrated in the hepatology consult, how it can help the patient to overcome this kind of agony in ESLD. So, uh, uh, important is also to understand about the preparedness planning for end-stage liver disease. So you talk about advanced care planning, we talk about disease-specific planning, each disease even in end-stage liver disease is different, though the final common pathway can be same. You have to talk about psychosocial issues and finances, you talk about quality of life determinants, I have a slide on quality of life, you'll see that after some time. We talk about ethical issues uh, relating to transplant, not to transplant, about consent taking, about uh, hepatic encephalopathy, medical technology and jargons, try to avoid them when we talk to the patient and caregivers, the location of care, home versus hospice versus hospital, what are the spiritual and religious preferences of the patient and caregiver? And an important point is about liver transplant is not the answer to every problem. There can be life limiting complications even after liver transplant or the patient can be even denied liver transplant if the patient doesn't suit or match the criteria. So this uh, is known as preparedness planning for end stage liver disease and can be brought in in your consult for palliative care. Now advanced care planning, uh, and a convincing argument to make it a part of liver transplant evaluation. So you can see that Manisha Verma uh, in the year 2020 in the journal liver transplant speaks about advanced care planning and integrating it into liver transplant programs. Because uh, classically in liver transplant programs, it's all about cure. The person gets a liver and the person becomes okay after that. They never think about the complications of liver transplant. They never think that the person might not get into a transplant pro program. So advanced care planning is relevant in that as well. You can go to the paper and you'll, you can see in details how they have done the study. So what is this feedback thing pop popping up? Sorry. The next slide is about measuring the uh, quality of life. So measuring quality of life for patients with end-stage liver disease, there are instruments for that. Uh, I think a lecture of palliative care is never complete unless you talk about the quality of life aspects. So you can read through the paper and they have, they have shown how they measure the quality of life in uh, patients with uh, ESLD using specific instruments. It is by Arpan Patel. It came out in 2020. And uh, a lot of I, uh, uh, authors are in the paper and it's definitely something you want to read about. So a uh, last slide almost. Uh, so uh, as we talked about, there isn't much uh, research into palliative care. So for the students, for the faculty, these are research ideas and this is a, actually a protocol. So you can go through the protocol. It will kind of... Uh, give an idea about the uh, future research that you might want to bring in into liver failure care. 
It's introducing uh, palliative care within the treatment of end-stage liver disease. It's a study protocol of our cluster RCT. It's again by Manisha Verma. It uh, came out in Journal of Palliative Medicine. And uh, uh, if you read the paper, you'll uh, probably get some ideas about research for the students as well. You can take it up as your thesis topic if you want. So basically I've come to the end of my presentation. So what we discussed today, I want to summarize if you want to take home few points. Uh, so number one point is that uh, end stage liver disease, patients have palliative care needs, definitely. That need has to be identified and that need has to be brought into uh, the audience of the hepatologist or the gastroenterologist. Symptom management is directed by underlying hepatic dysfunction. If you don't uh, understand the underlying hepatic dysfunction, the pharmacodynamics, the pharmacokinetics, it is difficult to manage the symptom because of the drug dosages and what medicines is to be used. There is potential benefit, though limited research, not a very high class research, but there is some research shows that there is potential benefit from concurrent and also integrated disease directed therapy and palliative care. And that's all folks. Thank you for your patient listening. Uh, you're welcome to contact me if you have any questions or feel free to call me up. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Such a wonderful presentation. I think you must have covered and you must have searched literature from all over the world, whatever possible. Thank you. Anuja, please go ahead with the questions because there are a lot of questions yeah. in the chat box. Indeed, a refreshing talk on very uh, beginning of the week. So um, we have quite a few questions. First question is uh, about, uh, is there a role of stem cell therapy in uh, liver diseases? Yeah, when I search the literature, there are some anecdotal evidence about stem cell therapy, but again, it's another those things. I would say that you take it as liver transplant. If you think that stem cell therapy is giving a lot of hope to the patient, that hope maybe, uh, the, that hope should be there, but we have to be careful about that might not work up. It is an experimental therapy and we should probably prepare the patient for advanced care planning and what happens if that thing doesn't work out in case. So I would rather focus on these areas. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, is there a role of spiral lactone in management of ascites related to liver diseases? Yeah, uh, I mean, I discussed about it. Uh, spiral lactone and frusamide both can be used and there is a maximal dose till, uh, which you can use it. It doesn't work, then you have to employ other management techniques. So, um, yeah, there, there are quite a few questions on hiccups around management of hiccups. So role of chlorpromazine and role of baclofen in management of hiccups. Yeah, uh, why I didn't mention chlorpromazine and baclofen is that uh, uh, not much research has been done in liver failure and uh, hiccups and the drugs uh, uh, in question. There is chlorpromazine and baclofen because they kind of have some kind of hepatic metabolism. But yeah, if you uh, are kind of uh, happy to use this medicines and it is these medicines that you use for hiccups. I would suggest you rather go for it, but you take care about the drug dosages, the frequency that you want to use and also the hepatic metabolism phase one and phase two metabolism where the drug is metabolized and probably used at a lesser dosage and wider interval. Also look out for the side effects like sedation. And of course you don't want to kind of confuse the patient more other uh, patient gets into hepatic NK. So we have to look into these aspects if you can Kind of look into these aspects and uh, be able to use the medicines uh, why not please go for it yeah thank you uh, how long should we give rifaximin is another question yeah good question so basically uh, the question rather i will ask the question in this way that why is rifaximin used it is used to prevent hepatic and cave and if you see that the person has kind of come out of hepatic and cave the azotemia in the blood in the serum is low the uh, precipitating factors aren't there then probably you can stop using Rifaximin, but unfortunately, I will say in our patients, most of them will probably not come out of hepatic and cave, uh, and uh, you might want to use rifaximin for quite some time. Yeah, and uh, there is a question on uh, fatigue, which is quite persistent in uh, liver diseases. So, uh, is there anything for management of fatigue? Not much evidence based uh, in fatigue. It's, a, it's an important uh, symptom in liver failure, yes, fatigue. So I would rather say go with the regular management that we do in palliative care, non pharmac And if non pharmac doesn't work, then uh, see why the fatigue is there. Is it hepatic and cave? Then rather you treat hepatic and cave, and that will take care of the fatigue. And uh, you can use some of the other drugs that you use uh, for fatigue management in palliative care. But again, I would like to uh, stress on this point. 
we uh, uh, read up about the uh, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of those drugs and how they are metabolized and use them at uh, a lesser dosage and a higher interval. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, there, there is a question on uh, guidelines for use of albumin in uh, liver diseases. And I yeah, think Pankaj, this is by uh, Pankaj. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the chat actually. Thanks to, thank you, Pankaj. So uh, yeah, I know it's a area of uh, great contention whether we should use albumin or not. And uh, I looked into literature, I looked into the guidelines. I mean, the guidelines are based on systematic reviews. So not much has been said about whether exuded or transuded and use albumin. I would rather say you go with your clinical judgment. If you see that the albumin is really less and if you give albumin, it can increase the albumin, probably help the patient. I don't know, uh, you might give it, but uh, one point is to understand here the albumin is tremendously expensive. Before you give albumin, I think we should cons consider that are we increasing the burden by giving albumin to the patient? And even if we are giving albumin, why? How long will it stay in the body? What benefit uh, will it bring to the patient at the cost of few thousands? Is it worth giving albumin? I would rather think about these points before giving albumin. Thank you, Arun. Uh, there's a question on use of tapentadol instead of tramadol on, uh, in pain management for the hepatic uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I saw that. So tapentadol uh, is a, a medicine that has come, I think, later after tra tramadol. So it has not been included into clinical research of uh, liver failure patient, but I suggest uh, follow the universal guidelines, use the drug with least dosage and higher interval and see if it works. If it works and if you have tapentadol, then uh, why not? You can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so there are a few comments which are uh, very relevant, I feel. Two comments by Dr. Raj Kopal, which says that uh, paracetamol is, uh, can be used in liver diseases, which is one of the uh, biggest dilemmas that people have. And another is about gabapentinoids. So uh, Dr. Raj has said that uh, he has emphasized that gabapentinoids have been taken off from WHO guidelines because of falsified data. So uh, these are few things that we should keep in mind. And another uh, point by Dr. Kekasha is about uh, the uh, jaundice, which is clinically evident only after the bilirubin rises more, more than two, but hyperbilirubinemia is more than one of bilirubin. So these are a couple of comments and there are a lot of con congratulatory remarks, Arun. Yeah, Excellent yeah. talk. Thank you everyone. For tapentadol, uh, I mean, I would rather, I would again uh, want to point, I have, we have few, uh, like three minutes. So tapentadol uh, can be used in renal failure if creatinine clearance is more than 30, dose adjustment not required, less than 30, not recommended. And in hepatic impairment, uh, mild hepatic impairment, mild moderate severe, I refer you to child food ABC. So dose adjustment not uh, required in mild. For moderate, you give 50 mg immediate release uh, three times a day and uh, taper it for severe, it is not recommended. That answers your question on tapenderol. Thank you.